welcome to another crucial episode of Rural Health Matters. I'm Tammy Arinder. Join us for an in-depth exploration of the current state of COVID-19 and its implications for rural health. Then stay tuned for an insightful conversation with Dr. Paul Friedrichs on the pandemic preparedness and response policies. This is Rural Health Matters, where the health of rural communities takes center stage. I'm joined now by Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Gold, we appreciate you joining us again this evening. And I know that our viewers and listeners always look forward to your updates and the opportunity to ask their questions a little later in the show. Let's get started with your latest numbers. Well, thank you, Tammy. It's great to be with you and to be with our audience this evening. And before I get started with the numbers, I just want to uh, personally extend my thanks, my most sincere gratitude to those who celebrated Veterans Day this last weekend. Uh, you know, I've learned uh, quite clearly that our freedom is not free, and those that wear the cloth of our nation deserve our special thanks and our special recognition, including, of course, our special guest tonight, uh, Dr. Paul Friedrichs, who we'll introduce in just a few minutes. So with that, let's get into some of the most recent COVID uh, and influenza statistics. Uh, and then, of course, as always, we very much look forward uh, to interacting with our audience. So if we can have the first graphic, please, just taking a look at the U.S. map and the daily hospitalizations. Uh, we seem to be hovering uh, at about 1.1 per 100,000 or approximately uh, 3,800 uh, daily average hospitalizations uh, over the last week. Uh, it's slightly down from last week. We just broke the 4,000 number last week. So we are slowly trending down. You can see that some states uh, have a higher number per 100,000 ratio of the population. However, these numbers are small and they're really tiny compared to where we were last year uh, and two years ago. When we look at some of the running trends of uh, hospitalization and uh, intensive care unit stays, going back to the very, very beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, you can see we did uh, still see a bit of a bump uh, over August and September, but for the last several weeks, uh, the numbers have come down. It looks like we're yet once more into a bit of plateau phase now as the weather is starting to get colder uh, and as we're getting closer and closer uh, to the holiday season. More to come on that in just a few minutes, but still a much lower than we were previously. You know, when we look at our hospitalization rates by age, you can see the 70 uh, age, year age and older are still clearly higher, uh, substantially higher than even the 60 to 69 year uh, age group. And again, uh, has come down since the late summer, early fall, but is now pretty well plateaued over the last couple of weeks, something we're gonna be monitoring quite carefully. Overall 14 day running average, uh, down 6% uh, over the last two weeks. So we've now had almost eight consecutive weeks of negative numbers there. When we look at the now cast models of uh, variants, uh, which has you know, almost become uh, irrelevant or less relevant uh, than it was previously, we're at about 25% of the HV1 uh, variant across the United States and about 21.9 uh, or almost 22% of the EG5 or the ARIS uh, variant. And when we look at the breakdown of these uh, Omicron subtypes across the United States, and we're looking at eight different geographic regions, you can see there's almost no difference. There's a little more ARIS in one part of the country than there is in the other, but really uh, not substantially different. We still are not looking at significant numbers of the 2.86 uh, subtypes or any of the newer variants that have been recently identified in other parts of the world. But we'll keep a close eye on this and uh, keep you aware uh, if and when any of those changes occur. Wastewater surveillance data, uh, updated total sites with current data, uh, just over 1,250 uh, sites, 1,257 uh, total. And again, the numbers are really very, very uh, embracing and very positive. Uh, every one of them is negative. Uh, and so we seem to be moving 
uh, in the right direction. And if you look at the map for the bright red and amber sites, every week the numbers are somewhat uh, less concerning. Uh, there still is some bright red uh, right in our home area across the uh, state of Nebraska. There's a bit of bright red, of course, in the Great Lakes region, which we've been following in the Northeast, a little bit in the Mid-Atlantic. But for the most part, uh, the rest of the country is pretty quiet with dark blue and light blue uh, colorations, indicating very low uh, viral counts uh, in the wastewater, which, of course, has been a good predictor for us of uh, future COVID uh, trends. If you look at uh, some of the COVID rates uh, in a graphic format over time, over the last year, uh, you can see that the blue components over the last several weeks have been increasing. The red and the amber are down as well. And so again, uh, even in, over the last several weeks, uh, we continue to see very positive trends. Indeed, the very highest level the 80 percent to 100 percent of uh, current viral particles uh, is down a full 17 percent, which is a significant fall off and a good predictor for those areas that are in the blue, uh, light blue and dark blue in our country, that the upcoming holiday season, two to four weeks from now, uh, should be fairly benign in terms of COVID spread. Time will tell. We'll get a good test of this in just the next couple of weeks. Shifting our discussion now to COVID mortality. Again, the numbers appear to be favorable. The bars in blue are the actual counts uh, across our nation uh, going back a full year to uh, late October of 22, and certainly a good deal lower than we were this time last year, which was a good deal lower than where we were two years ago. Uh, some of the gray bars, which show some of the predicted future trends, are incomplete, but the, but the overall trend analysis uh, has been stable to decreasing the number of uh, COVID deaths uh, in our uh, nation. Uh, we are at about 0.3 per 100,000 deaths, uh, weekly COVID deaths 940. Again, that is 940 members of our families that will not join us for Thanksgiving dinner, that will not be there to open uh, packages uh, and presents uh, with our kids and grandkids and their parents uh, together. And so every one of these preventable deaths uh, means a huge amount. But if you look at the total number of deaths from influenza-like illnesses, which is all of the viral pneumonias, including COVID and influenza and RSV and everything else, uh, the numbers are very flat and not alarmingly rising in any way, particularly as we are entering uh, more of a peak of the flu season, colder weather, more indoor events, uh, et cetera. And so uh, let's move on and uh, talk about uh, uh, well, this is the global daily COVID uh, vaccine data, uh, and the U.S. data looks relatively similar, but the numbers of vaccinations uh, worldwide have really gone down uh, quite a bit. So this includes individuals who are getting new vaccine for the first time and individuals uh, who are getting boosted. So uh, just a couple of uh, updates before we introduce our guest this evening. Uh, the first comes from a late October, October 30th uh, publication in which the World Health Organization issued an epidemiologic update on COVID-19. And what they said in their uh, update is according to their latest data on COVID-19, over a half million new cases and over 4,700 uh, worldwide deaths were reporting just during the last 28 day period during the month of October uh, from September 25 through October 22. And they go out to point out that this is a decrease of 42 or 43 percent of the number of cases and the number of deaths uh, over the last year. Again, this is extremely favorable, but it's still uh, quite a few cases and uh, quite a few deaths uh, worldwide that are attributed uh, to COVID. And of course, uh, these are all very underreported uh, because of the amount of transmission and the amount of death and hospitalization that's occurring in some of the developing countries, as well as in some of the developed countries uh, around the world. 
Uh, another report that uh, just came out in the Journal of the American Heart Association uh, looked at uh, patients uh, with hypertension uh, and diabetes. And again, this was a very large study of 1.5 million U.S. adults who had a diagnosis of high blood pressure or a diagnosis of medication-dependent diabetes, uh, either type 1 or type 2, insulin-dependent, oral medication-dependent, et cetera. And what it showed uh, was a very significant increased risk of severe COVID as measured by hospitalization, intensive care unit use, ventilator use, and unfortunately and tragically uh, loss of life uh, due to COVID infections. And so what it tells us is that particularly for populations that are at high risk, in this case, uh, high blood pressure or hypertension and diabetes, that getting vaccinated uh, and taking precautions to be sure that you try as everything you can uh, with public health measures to not get COVID is still really important in spite of the prevalence of very effective oral medication uh, to reduce the severity uh, of the illness. This was another study that was published just recently, about 10 days ago, in the Diabetes Care Journal. And it looked at the impact of vaccination prior to COVID-19 infection. And what it demonstrated, coming back to this uh, concept of new onset of diabetes, and we have talked about this on this broadcast several times, that in post-COVID, long COVID syndromes, there is an incidence of sustained uh, medication-dependent diabetes. And what this, what this study showed, that in those individuals, uh, particularly those at higher risk, older age, obesity, family history of diabetes or some evidence of pre-diabetes, that those that were vaccinated, even if they went on to get a case of COVID, which would likely be less severe or certainly less frequent, uh, but if they did get COVID for prior, uh, with a prior vaccination, that they had a significantly lower risk of developing long-term diabetes. Again, yet another good reason to think about rolling up our sleeves on getting vaccinated and getting boosted. Another study that was very similar uh, looked at the role of vaccination uh, that reduced the risk of new onset of asthma. So not just diabetes, but this was an article published, and again, in a peer-reviewed journal, the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in Practice, and it demonstrates the fact that COVID is definitely a risk factor for new onset of asthma in both adults and children, and that those that were vaccinated uh, had a lower incidence of developing asthma, meaning reactive airway type symptoms, uh, even if they got COVID, than those that got COVID and were not vaccinated. Again, another strong indication that vaccination not only reduces the likelihood of getting infected and the severity of illness, but in this case reduces uh, the incidence of diabetes and the incidence of uh, asthma. This was another article that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, Network. Uh, and this was a look at the prevalence of autoimmune and autoinflammatory tissue disorders. So you think talking about things here like uh, lupus, uh, like rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases that we've all come to know. And what this study shows us is that those individuals who developed COVID uh, had a higher incidence of developing these lifelong autoimmune and anti-inflammatory connective tissue uh, diseases. And uh, these are sometimes extremely difficult to treat, uh, can be sustained for long periods of time, do a lot of damage uh, to our joints, uh, such as in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis and similar areas, inflammatory bowel disease, and, and so many other uh, autoimmune and autoinflammatory connective tissue diseases. And so again, as we go into the holiday season, a good indication for vaccination and for the practical aspects of uh, prevention. A couple of words about flu. Uh, you know, this was uh, another uh, publication from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And the headline was flu season remains mostly green. And if we uh, look at 
uh, the map of our nation. You can see what they mean by mostly green. These are some of the lowest rates of influenza or influenza-like illness activity in the United States. Uh, we really have none of the uh, purple, dark blue. Uh, there is some uh, flu in Puerto Rico. There's uh, some that's relatively high uh, in Alaska. But for the most part, in the U.S., we're in the moderate stages uh, to the low or even minimal stages in certain parts of our country. And we're relatively favorable. Uh, this was uh, through week 43, which ended October 28th, so just about two weeks ago. So we'll continue to monitor this very closely. But right now, uh, you know, hopefully a lot of folks got their flu vaccines, uh, and those flu vaccines are being effective. Uh, we'll see where we are in the next couple of weeks as the flu season continues to evolve. And then finally, and of great relevance uh, to this audience, uh, uh, this headline reveals, uh, you know, again from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, that nearly a million chickens uh, will be killed on a Minnesota farm because of our bird flu, uh, H5N1. And, you know, if you read the updates uh, today, there's yet another location uh, in one of our neighboring states, in Iowa, where another million uh, chickens uh, will be slaughtered to help limit the spread of highly contagious bird flu. You know, we talked a lot about bird flu uh, last year and two years ago, and we're going to continue to monitor it very carefully with this audience because we know this is not just about the price of putting protein on the table for our families, but this is really very much about the livelihood of many of our farmers and ranchers. You can see there's a reference here to uh, 26,000 turkeys on a farm in South Dakota, uh, 17,000 birds elsewhere. You know, we had about 60 million poultry slaughtered uh, last year uh, due to uh, bird flu. And this has been a recurring theme across our nation and something that we need to continue to monitor with the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, very carefully. And so if I uh, have any closing words for you today before we take your questions and introduce our very, very special guest, uh, uh, what can we do to help in terms of vaccination in rural America? One is uh, stay up to date on your uh, respiratory infection vaccines, your ILI, your influenza-like illness vaccines, including COVID, RSV, influenza, uh, and others. Know where your local and regional uh, current healthcare access to vaccines and testing are. You know, there are all kinds of test kits that are still available now on the market. And if you think you may be infected with one of these uh, influenza-like illnesses, Go ahead and get tested, because if you test positive, you probably don't want to sit down at Thanksgiving dinner with your loved ones, particularly if they're older or are more vulnerable due to one of the high-risk diseases. Again, the data shows uh, quite conclusively that vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, we talked a lot about pregnancy recently. We talked a lot about protection of newborns for moms that are vaccinated during the last trimester of their pregnancy, but also the data for kiddos and for adults uh, on the safety and efficacy of these vaccines are some of the safest and most effective. Indeed, recent statistics, we've administered over 700 million doses of COVID vaccine alone in the United States in the last several years since Operation Warp Speed was uh, put into play. And so, uh, good news there. And that uh, just reminding our audience again that vaccines and antivirals are particularly important for adults over 65 and those that are immunocompromised at all ages. And they not only prevent the disease and reduce the severity, but as we saw today in some of the literature, uh, that even those with hypertension uh, or diabetes, less severity of illness. It prevents new onset of diabetes and new onset of asthma-like symptoms. So, Tammy, uh, back to you, and I very much look forward to your questions and, of course, to questions and comments uh, from our audience tonight. So, thank you.
Absolutely. Thank you. You always do so much work on that end, trying to get that information to us and help us understand it. Some good advice there. And so we're going to take a quick break first, but we are going to open our phone lines because you are a very important part of this show. That phone number is 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions. And when we come back, Dr. Paul Friedrichs will join our conversation. Don't go away. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Tammy Arinder. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome in Dr. Paul Friedrichs. Dr. Friedrichs has a new job since we last had him on the show several months ago. Dr. Friedrichs is now Deputy Assistant to the President and is the inaugural director of the White House Office of Pandemic Preparedness and Response Policy. He now advises the President and coordinates U.S. government efforts on preparing for and responding to pandemics and other biologic events. Now, he also previously served as Senior Director for Global Health Security and Biodefense at the White House National Security Council. And before his retirement from the U.S. Air Force, we knew him as Joint Staff Surgeon at the Pentagon. Welcome, Dr. Friedrichs, and congratulations on your new job. It looks like you're not slowing down in retirement. You may be busier than ever. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy, and you're exactly right. Uh, it's a real privilege to serve in this role and to try and continue to help uh, Americans all across the country and very grateful for the opportunity. And I'm grateful to be back here on the show with you and with Dr. Gold, especially as we get ready to celebrate National Rural Health Week later this month. That's right. Well, we are honored to have you here. We know how busy you are. Let's talk about COVID-19. Many of us have had the pandemic in our rearview mirror for quite some time now, but I'm assuming that in your new role, probably not in your rearview mirror. Yeah, you're exactly right about that, Tammy. And I, you know, I'd encourage everyone, I, you know, we, we'd all like to not have to think about this anymore. Uh, but I'll, I'll share a little personal story. Uh, my parents just celebrated their 61st wedding anniversary. Uh, so they got married back in the early 1960s. Dad will be 97 in January. Mom is 86. And uh, so when we got together for their anniversary a couple of weekends ago, uh, you know, I called them ahead of time and I said, man, I really hope that you all are vaccinated. Uh, as we get together with groups of people, uh, the last thing we want is for either of them to get sick. We want to be able to celebrate Thanksgiving with them. We want to be able to celebrate Christmas with them, not just this year, but in the years ahead. And as Dr. Gold shared in his uh, rundown at the beginning of the show there, we know we have safe and effective vaccines, not only for COVID, but also for the flu and for RSV or the respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, this is the first time in the history of mankind we've never before had vaccines for all three of these illnesses. And that's pretty remarkable. That means that people who used to get sick and in some cases die of these illnesses don't have to have that happen to them. They can be home for Thanksgiving. They can celebrate Christmas or families. So, yes, we are spending a lot of time thinking about that. And as we look at the numbers, as Dr. Gold said, they're not super high right now, which is great news. But as I look back on the calendar here, pretty much every year of my life, as you get into November and then get into December, the numbers start going up again for flu and they start going up for RSV. And for the last three years, we've seen that, you know, every year for the last three years, we've had a winter spike of COVID. So we definitely are thinking about this and strongly encouraging Americans to go out and get their vaccines. You can get them together, you can get them separately, whatever is most convenient for you. Talk to your doctor or to your, uh, to your primary care provider if you have questions about when to get which vaccine. But we sure do hope that you will get vaccinated so that you and your family can have a safe and healthy holiday season this year. Yeah, good advice. And of course, congratulations to your parents. What an incredible milestone there. So glad they're healthy. Now, I have to ask you, is there a different mindset going from a long military career to serving in a civilian position? Well, thanks, Tammy. That's a, it's kind of an interesting question. Uh, you know, when I joined the military, people trusted me uh, when I said I was here to serve my country. And 
when I led units in combat or when I led units here at home, people trusted that I was going to do the right thing for the men and women uh, in my unit and give the right advice to people that I work for. And when I became a doctor, people trusted me and uh, you know, brought their most difficult medical problems and asked me for advice. And I gave them the best information and advice that I could as a surgeon, operated on thousands of people. And then as I moved into these more senior roles, I'm very grateful for the trust that people have had in me over many years now, as you mentioned at the Pentagon, uh, for the last four years, uh, giving medical advice on how to best protect the 2.4 million men and women who volunteer to serve in uniform for our country. And now I'm really humbled to be in a job where, again, you know, the, the most important thing I do is tell the truth. I, I give advice. But now it's advice to everybody. It's uh, it's a remarkable privilege and honor to be in a position to try and share the best that we know today about how to protect uh, Americans all over this great country of ours from biological threats, things like COVID and flu and, uh, and other illnesses like that. And then to think about some of the things that come along down the pike. So I think the short answer to your question is no, it's still all about trust. It's still all about telling the truth, what we know today, and the things that we think we know, but are still learning more about so that any anybody can make the best decision, whether it's, whether it's a mom or dad trying to decide what to do for their kids or the president trying to decide what to do uh, here for our country. Well, we are so honored to have you in that leadership position there and helping us with the health care of our country and our nation. We do have our first caller this evening. It's Sharon from Illinois. Sharon, welcome in. What's your question? Yes, my question is, what would Dr. Gold's recommendations be for a person if they would contract COVID that, that's taking Eliquis uh, for uh, AFib and Flectidine for um heart rate control, and then a baby aspirin and high blood pressure. What, uh, what would be the best treatment for this? Yeah, well, Sharon, thank you so much for calling, and I, I hope that this is not you, but uh, if it's one of your family members or loved ones, uh, first of all, as we always say, health care begins at home, and that means that the best advice is always going to come from your local health care professional, the clinic, or whoever delivers the health care to this individual, because depending on their age, uh, their comorbidities, meaning do they have diabetes, do they have blo high blood pressure, uh, do they have heart disease or anything else, uh, their risks and the treatments might be different. But overall, uh, early intervention, uh, if they're in the older age groups with an oral agent such as Paxlovid, uh, staying away from other people, uh, staying well hydrated, trying to get some sleep uh, as best as possible, uh, and doing everything you can uh, to accelerate uh, the resolution of this and, of course, to try very hard not to spread it. Uh, if the symptoms get more severe, uh, again, always, always reach out to your local health care professional. But uh, let's uh, ask our expert on the, who we happen to have with us tonight, uh, Dr. Friedrichs. Do you have uh, any uh, different advice for our caller? Uh, no, Dr. Gold, I think that you got that exactly right. And I'd say that, you know, not only talking to your, uh, to your local physician or to your friend's physician about that, but this is a good opportunity to remind Americans that if you go to covidtest.gov, C-O-V-I-D-T-E-S-T.gov, you can actually order COVID tests to be shipped to your home. The Postal Service has them prepackaged and they're shipping them within a day of receiving your order. So as Dr. Gold said, an important part of protecting your loved ones is testing in case you're feeling kind of weather that, uh, or if you've had COVID, those around you can test to see if they've got it uh, even before they experience symptoms. So I uh, hope that folks will go online and order those tests to be delivered to their homes so that they can that they lower the risk of sharing COVID with anyone else if they do have it. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I was wondering if you were still able to get those free tests through the Postal Service, so appreciate that. We are going to get to more questions, I promise you, Dr. Friedrichs, but we already have another caller. We have Joanne from Florida on the line. Joanne, what's your question? Hi. Um, I re I'm in my 70s. I received the second COVID vaccine, which was a Pfizer 
five minutes after, and I have no medical history. I have no medical issues at my age. I don't take any medications. My health is pretty good. So my question is, I got the second vaccine. Five minutes after I got it, my normal heart rate is in the 50s. It went to the 130s. It lasted for about 15, 20 minutes, and then I went home. The next day I got up and I was feeling fine. A little bit later, my heart started banging in my chest for 45 minutes. And I did a televisit with my physician's office, and they said, you need to go to the ER. I went to the ER. My blood pressure was sky high. Now, that was very scary experience to me. And one of the nurses there said to me, we get patients in here every day with exactly what's happening to you. And I said, are you going to report this reaction? They said, no, you have to report it yourself. So I had to write a letter to Pfizer to explain what happened to me. They sent me the same 14-page form four times. I don't think they really even care whatsoever. So I'm not going to get another vaccine. I had to have an echocardiogram. I had to go to a specialized cardiologist. He said, well, next time... Go and have the vaccine, but just take two Dylanols before you take it. So no more vaccines for me. I don't believe in it. I believe that China did this to us intentionally to kill us off. I don't trust them. I don't trust Fauci, and I don't trust any of you. So there. Well, Joanne, uh, thank you so much for calling, and I'm so sorry to hear uh, about your uh, bad experiences uh, all I would say is that if you look at the literature uh, that the, we now have, as I said earlier, over 700 million doses of vaccine administered in the U.S., uh, your chance of a bad reaction, hospitalization, or even losing your life is thousands of times lower with the vaccine than it is from getting infected. Hopefully, uh, you will not get infected uh, with uh, COVID, and uh, hopefully the vaccine that you received will be protective, at least to some extent, for you uh, uh, into the future. You know, the, we listen uh, very carefully to our audience, uh, and when folks call in and talk about experiences such as yours, uh, it is definitely a, a point of concern for us. But the best that I can do Uh, not only as a clinician and as a university leader here, but frankly, as a parent and as a spouse, uh, is make the most important scientifically-based decisions uh, we can. You know, I'm sure, uh, Dr. Friedrichs, you've heard stories similar to this uh, before as well. And uh, do you have a preferred way of uh, reassuring uh, folks uh, such as this and others in the community who may have a friend or a relative who had a reaction that they believed to be a vaccine. You know, that's one, I'll I'll add one other thing, uh, Paul, before you comment, and that is I've seen an awful lot of people who tell a story very similar to this, which of course I'm sure is accurate, but then it turns out they have some kind of underlying heart disease and end up getting treated for either atrial fibrillation or some other problem that was only unmasked by exposure to either COVID or the vaccine and was really an underlying problem that uh, caused them uh, to seek medical care and treatment at at times in the future. So do you have any thoughts, sir? Well, thank you. And I, like you, I'm very sorry to hear of, uh, of what happened there. You know, as a doctor, we go into medicine to help people. Uh, You know, there's, there's nothing, nothing more or less than that. I, I was just with a whole bunch of doctors uh, here at a meeting in town yesterday. And, you know, every one of them goes into medicine because they want to help people, not because anybody wants to hurt people. So I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that that was your experience. Uh, I'd offer a couple of thoughts. Uh, the, you know, you mentioned you had the Pfizer vaccine. There's another vaccine for COVID made uh, by a different company using a different process uh, that's called the Novavax uh, vaccine. And I would encourage you to talk to your doctor about the, the pros and cons, the, the benefits and the risks of getting that vaccine. Uh, it is also protective against COVID, but it's a different uh, manufacturing process than the one that you had. 
And then I, I just reiterate what Dr. Gold shared that, you know, it is, it's important that we have these discussions and that we try to learn what happened. I can tell you that we go online, we look at all of the reports that come in from around the country, uh, people having experiences of any imaginable sort uh, for every type of medication that is given for vaccines, over-the-counter medicines. And as those reports come in, we look very carefully at them to try and understand if there's additional studies that we need to do. And over time, we aggregate all that data, we add it all up, look at it to see if maybe there's different groups that are having a particular reaction or response so I, I can assure you, ma'am, that those reports are very valuable, and we do look at them on a regular basis. The folks down in Atlanta and up here in Washington track that very carefully. And as you've probably seen, we go back and we change recommendations if there's evidence or data to suggest that we need to change the recommendations of giving people. So I'm grateful that you did share both today and after the event what happened. And so sorry that it happened to you. Right. We feel the same way. Joanne, we do hear you. We are glad you shared your story and that uh, and that we can learn from that, certainly. Well, Dr. Friedrich, we know you're a retired major general, and so you're always kind of preparing for the next battle, so to speak. So in your role now, how do you prepare for the next pandemic? Because you really don't know what that could be. How do you prepare for that? Yeah, uh, so... You know, in the military, we talk a lot about plans and we do exercises and we do training events to prepare for all sorts of things that, that we have to do in the military to protect our community. And I think that, you know, that's sort of where we are right now with our discussions about respiratory diseases. And part of what we're focusing on in our office is there are lots of different diseases that may occur someday. But there, as we have just been talking about for the last 30 minutes, are diseases that happen every year. You know, I'll be 58 here in a few weeks. And every year for the last 57 years, October seems to happen just around the same time of year. It comes right after September, right before November. And every year after October starts, you start seeing people get sick with respiratory syncytial virus. Then you start seeing people get sick with flu. And then you start seeing people now get sick with COVID uh, in the winter spike for those three illnesses. So part of what we're focusing on is how do we take the lessons learned and the best practices of how to get vaccines out to rural communities, how to make sure that folks who are not living in a big city have the same access to care, therapeutics and the vaccines that people living here in Washington or in, uh, in Omaha or other large cities might have, and make sure that that's the norm every year, not just during a pandemic. Because at the end of the day, these are illnesses that we can largely prevent from causing the sort of severe uh, you know, hospitalizations or even death that used to be very common. And so we're spending a lot of time focusing on that, taking those best practices from my military career. How do you plan ahead for things to lower the risk? Bad things, unfortunately, almost always happen, even if you do everything right. But what we're trying to do is figure out how we can lower that risk to the greatest extent possible. And the other thing that we're trying to do, and this goes back to Joanne's story, is share what we know. You know I, you'll never hear me say that we've got all the answers. My wife assures me and for 28 years has told me that I seldom have the right answer, especially when she and I are disagreeing on things. But when you pull it up to the big level and you look at the practice of medicine and you look at how complex the human body is, we're continuing to learn every day. I mean, I was out in Seattle a couple of weeks ago meeting with researchers and there's incredible work being done on new medicines, on new technologies that are likely to change the way that we practice medicine in the next five to 10 years. That's really exciting. And we need to be planning for that and thinking about how all Americans will have access to that uh, and then explaining it to them as clearly as possible so that they understand as these changes occur, what the pros and the cons and the benefits and the risks are so they can make informed choices. So it's a pretty cool job and it's a great opportunity to leverage a lot of the things that I learned over the last 37 years in uniform.
Yeah, great to have you on the front lines and for all of us to be able to see what technology and science and research is doing. We do have Jay from Canada on the line. Jay, don't hate me, but we're going to take a quick break. Hold on. We are going to get to your call, I promise. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters. Stay with us. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Tammy Arinder. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Dr. Paul Friedrichs. And we do have Jerry from Canada on the line. Jerry, what's your question? Uh, yes, I received uh, two vaccine shots, and I was, my question is, I'm leery about getting the, uh, boosters, and I want to know how many I would have to receive. Like, are they going to be on a regular basis? You get that question, Dr. Gold? Yeah, I think maybe Dr. Gold, if you don't mind, I can jump in on that one. And, you know, I, that's a great question to ask. And it's the same one that my parents asked. Uh, the, the short answer to your question, Jerry, is depending on your medical condition, uh, and it's a great discussion to have with your primary care provider, whoever that might be, because they'll know your history uh, very well and can give you the best advice. But in general, the answer is yes. As if it's been more than a few months uh, since you had your last COVID vaccine, we are recommending that folks get another booster. The formulation that's out right now is different than the one that was available even uh, four or five months ago. And it's specifically designed to protect you against severe illness from the currently circulating uh, variants of COVID. But even more importantly than that, there's a, a discussion to have about the flu vaccine and the RSV vaccine. And all three of those are recommended if you're over the age of 60, which I'm getting a lot closer to right now. Uh, so yes, we do recommend that folks get that. And then your question about, is this gonna be an annual thing for the COVID vaccine is a really important question. And you know, I, I'll give you a very honest answer. I don't know. I think that the data right now, as we look at it, suggests that for many Americans and for folks in Canada and other countries around the world who have had prior vaccinations, it's likely that we will continue to recommend that they get an annual COVID shot, just like we recommend getting an annual flu shot. For some folks who are older or who have really significant medical problems, we may recommend getting a COVID vaccine twice a year, but the data is still being collected on that. And you know, as I told folks before, one of the things that I've tried really hard to do my whole life is tell you the truth. So I'll just tell you that right now, for sure, you should talk to your primary care doctor about getting a vaccine right now, getting a, the new COVID vaccine and the flu and the RSV vaccine. And then check back with your doctor to see whether you should get a follow-on booster next year. Yeah, thank you for jumping in on that question. Jerry, we appreciate you calling in from Canada. Uh, next on the line, we have Lloyd from North Dakota. Lloyd, what would you like to ask our experts? Yes, good evening. Thank you for taking your time, everyone, to talk about this timely subject. I have a two-pronged question, not too hard. Uh, firstly, are you aware if there are any conclusive testing methods available that would show whether a person has indeed taken one or more COVID vaccines? And secondly, if these results could be differentiated from someone who, you know, for example, wasn't vaccinated and actually caught a wild variant of COVID and now has natural immunity? This is sort of a contentious question at my employment situation right now. So I'd be interested to see uh, what your panel would, could give me for answers. Yeah, Lloyd, uh, you know, I'm going to defer to our expert in a minute, but uh, I do believe that it is possible to distinguish uh, between the two. And that is because uh, when you get infected with COVID, you not only make antibodies to the spike proteins, but you make antibodies to other parts of the viral particle as well, particularly to what's called the nucleocapsid part of the virus. And so one can measure both nucleocapsid antibodies and spike protein uh, antibodies separately, which would indicate previous infection. Whereas the vaccines create immunity through uh, use of the spike protein itself and not the nucleocapsid proteins. 
And so theoretically, if you have measurable antibodies, I believe it should be possible to tell the difference. But uh, Dr. Friedrichs, what do you think? Is that still possible these days? Well, it, Dr. Gold, it is, and I agree with everything that you said. I, I'd add a couple of points, uh, Lloyd, as you as you talk to your uh, folks at work about this. So it is getting more difficult, though, over time as, as the virus mutates, and these tests are not the ones that you can order at the drugstore. So this is not something where you can get the, the, the test that will mail you from covidtest.gov, for example, or that you can buy at CVS or Walgreens. These are very particular tests that Dr. Gold was referring to there. And so if you want to go through that testing process, it has to be done at the right kind of lab that has the capability to do that very sophisticated work that Dr. Gold was describing. In general, the answer is yes. There's, there's a few uh, catches to that, depending on how long ago you were infected and a variety of other things, how long ago you were vaccinated. But it, in general, the answer is yes, but it's not something that you can pick up at the store and do at home. All right, good answers. Lord, we appreciate you calling in. If you have a question for our experts, you can pick up the phone. It's 877-731-6733. You are welcome to be a part of this show. Dr. Friedrich, talk about, in your new role now there at the White House, do you still get to work with medical centers around the country like Dr. Gold's UNMC and kind of help them prepare as they go along in this process? So uh, thanks, Tammy. The short answer is yes. Uh, you know, I had the real pleasure of uh, heading down to Texas uh, about two months ago now and uh, spending some time with colleagues at Texas A&M and from other uh, medical centers around Texas. And I've had a chance to meet, as I mentioned a moment ago, with a bunch of uh, medical colleagues who were in Washington for a medical just this past weekend. Uh, you know, I'm... I'm always excited, honestly, to get out of Washington and get get out to the rest of the country and talk to my colleagues out there and hear what they're experiencing, because that's where the real patient care is happening. You know, we we do all that we can to help here in Washington, but at the end of the day, it's really valuable to go out and listen to our colleagues who are on the front lines taking care of patients every day. I'm lucky that my wife is a is a practicing internal medicine doctor, and so I do get the benefit of her insights on what I did wrong pretty much every day, uh, and is also her advice on what we need to fix as we go forward. Uh, but getting out to those medical centers is really important, and I'm excited that uh, I'll actually get a chance to come out to Nebraska coming up here in a few weeks, spend some time with uh, Dr. Gold and his colleagues as well. I think that's fantastic that you do get away from Washington and get to see kind of what's going on in the different areas of the country. I also bet it's a very interesting conversation at your dinner table every night with your wife. I can tell you guys really respect each other and what you do. So now we've asked you this before about being both a major general and a doctor, which to me sounds like two very different hats. But does that doctor hat ever really come off? No, it really doesn't. You know, I I was 17 when I took the first oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And I'm incredibly proud of the 37 years I spent in uniform. Uh, and I became a doctor and have been incredibly grateful for the trust that patients have had in me to take care of them, to take care of their loved ones. Uh, I think what's similar between being in the military and being a doctor is that there is a lot of trust involved. Uh, you know, when I was in combat, the people that I was leading trusted that I would do the right thing to protect them and to make sure that we got the job done. And when I talked to the moms and dads of people who I had the privilege of commanding, they trusted that I would do the right thing, just like moms and dads trust that my colleagues and I will do the right thing when we take care of their sons or daughters who walk into our exam room. This job is, you know, another opportunity where I hope that folks will trust that we're truly trying to do the right thing for all Americans. Uh, we're not perfect. And sometimes we need to step back and say, you know, we didn't get that one right. Uh, but I hope people will believe that Dr. Gold and his colleagues, and my team here, all of us truly are dedicated to try to give the best advice, offer the best treatments, vaccines, and therapeutics so that Americans all over our great country can spend the holidays with their families and their loved ones, be healthy, be happy, and enjoy that life, liberty, and the pursuit of freedom that we talk so much about. 
Yeah, I can tell that health comes first for you for our entire nation. We have our next caller and we have Ernest uh, from Minnesota. Ernest, what's your question? That says that when Dr. Cool, what you talked about the virus with the chickens and turkeys and stuff, it seems to me like uh, this COVID, they jumped on the bandwagon, got a vaccine for it. Why can't they get something deal, a uh, medication they can put in the water or the feed for the turkeys and chickens to kill off that uh, virus? So, Ernest, that's a great question because not only does that impact uh, the ability to put food on the table for our nation, and by the way, around the world, but also the livelihood of many people who uh, raise poultry uh, as part of their farming and ranching uh, you know, life on a, on a daily basis. And it's, it's my understanding that there is some vaccine being developed, uh, not yet widely available, probably uh, would require an injection rather than put in the feed or in the poultry. But I don't know, Dr. Friedrichs, do you have any experience in uh, bird flu and any thoughts? I know the human transmission is extremely rare, although it is a serious illness, and we are worried about that. But uh, what about protecting the birds themselves and, and stopping this at its source? Yeah, so there are a lot of discussions about that. And Ernest, you, you asked that it's not a million dollar question, it's a billion dollar question. And uh, so, yes, there's research on vaccines and other options to try and protect the poultry flocks. And as Dr. Gold said, part of that is because the poultry industry is so important. Part of it also is because if there's a virus or an illness spreading through these flocks, we don't want it to then spread to other uh, species like us. So we are working hard on that. Our Department of Agriculture and colleagues all over the world are working on that. Uh, but it's not yet available in this country. Right. Ernest, thank you so much for that question. That is certainly a story that we keep up with daily here at RFD TV. Um, we are getting down to the last few minutes of our show, and I know both of you kind of really want to drive home some points. So, Dr. Friedrich, let's start with you. Some questions and answers that you want people to take away from this show today. Yeah, I'd, I'd say two real points that I'd leave you with. Uh, the first one is uh, there's there are three vaccines, one for COVID, one for RSV, and one for flu. First time ever that we have had that opportunity to offer that kind of protection. Please talk to your primary care doctors about whether this is the right time for you to get vaccinated. Uh, we talk a lot about the pros and cons of vaccines. I'll share a little story that to me is really important. Very first immunization campaign in this country was by George Washington, the founder of our country, uh, when he was fighting the British in the, in the colonial war there, in the War of Independence. He had so many people getting sick from smallpox. So he was losing more people from illness than he one, you know losing more people from illness than from combat. And he said, you know, we've got to do something about that. And ever since, uh, my colleagues and I have tried to offer safe and effective protection for Americans uh, so that they can make that choice about protecting themselves and their loved ones. So please do that. And then secondly, please keep telling us what your experiences are. We're not perfect and we certainly don't know all the answers. We need to hear from you so that we can keep doing this better next year and the year after that. Thank you all, and God bless. Well, we thank you so much. Absolutely share your stories with us, with your healthcare professionals, because that's how they get the information and do things right and make sure that we can progress in the right direction. Okay, we've got about 45 seconds left, Dr. Gold. Your parting thoughts? Sure, just, uh, of course, to uh, thank our audience and most especially to thank uh, Dr. Friedrichs, not just for his time this evening to join us, and not just for his years and years of service to our nation and the cloth of our nation, but for willing to take this critically important leadership role today, building the trust and the confidence of our nation in the future of our health is what it's all about. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us.